Royal Highness, Dear Excellencies, Friends, a People and Planet, it's a great honor for me to give the State of the Union address together with Sanya Nishtar, one of my great heroes on health in the world. As you can hear, the state of my voice is not perfect today. And uh, I've got green light from my doctor. You are the one suffering, not me. Take it, <laughs> take it as a scientific indicator. The state of my voice is a reflection of the state of the planet. <laughs> but we'll work for it. And I promise you, I'm getting better. We have so much scientific evidence that Isabella Levine, our vice prime minister in Sweden, is right. We need a revolution. We have the best untold story in town. Rising global risks, food is a prerequisite to succeed. We need transformations. We can do it. We can actually feed humanity within planetary boundaries. In fact, there's such a smorgasbord of scientific evidence coming through the pipeline. Papers showing the synergies between health, food, and climate change. That we can feed humanity without deforestation. That we can actually do better on food and equity within biodiversity. The latest study on one and a half degrees Celsius from the IPCC work is phenomenal. To the lower left here, you see in black the remaining carbon budgets to stay under one and a half degrees Celsius. On the left-hand side here, you see the only two scenarios that actually include changes in diets. On the vertical here, you have the recognition that we need massive scale negative emission technologies to stay under one and a half degrees Celsius. Simply speaking, big CCS, which is an enormous challenge. But look at the food scenarios. These are the only ones that actually reduce the need for carbon capture and storage. And the green here is a synergy with sustainable food systems, sequestering carbon, and achieving healthy diets. We have something big here, which lands in the conclusion that we will fail on Paris without a transformation to sustainable healthy food. Science is behind this conclusion. But we have enormous challenges, dear friends. This paper came out just a month back showing that to reach major sustainable and social indicators on the y-axis here, you have the Human Development Index, life expectancy, better health. The higher up you are, the more welfare you have. Up in the right-hand corner here, you have the rich countries in the world, including a country like Sweden. But unfortunately, the x-axis is how many planetary boundaries you're transgressing. So the truth is, we're still delivering better lives unsustainably, transgressing planetary boundaries. The left circle here is Sweden, fulfilling the desired blue space on social equity and welfare, but going way out and overshooting planetary boundaries. The right hand is Sri Lanka, challenges on social indicators, but really staying within a safe operating space. We need to move the dial globally on transformations. Science also shows, which will be presented in San Francisco at the Global Climate Action Summit, together with Christiana Figueres, who is here with us during these two days, that is a disruptive, transformative innovation pathway to reach a fossil fuel-free world by 2050. But it's also, as China is showing, a disruptive transformation for food, that they're aiming to reduce meat consumption by 50% by 2050, moving fast on transformations on food. But, as we all know, despite all the great islands of success, despite Gunnit's point that we're starting to see momentum, we are here after all together, we're not bending the curves. Actually, in fact, the hockey sticks continue in the wrong direction. On obesity, on antimicrobial resistance, on NCDs, on the major issues on meat consumption. We need to start bending the curve urgently. And the challenges are related very much, Sanya, to health. Yes, indeed, the challenges are very much related to health. In fact, global health, food systems, and planetary health are deeply intertwined, which is why the food we eat has a very strong association with all the unprecedented global health challenges that we are faced with today. Today, pandemic influenza, antimicrobial resistance, and non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular diseases, cancers, diabetes, and certain chronic lung conditions are threatening to wipe out the development gains of the last century. 
and their risk threats can all be traced back to the food we eat and to food systems. In fact, unhealthy diets account for the largest global burden of disease today. And the risks from unhealthy diets to mortality and morbidity outweighs the risks from tobacco use, drugs, alcohol, and unsafe sex all combined. The scale of the challenge uh, which inadequate food and inadequate mic micronutrients on the one hand and unhealthy diets on the other hand pose is really staggering. And this was also reiterated uh, by Her Excellency the Vice Prime Minister. Uh, two billion people lack the micronutrients that are essential for well-being. On the one hand, we see 155 million children stunted, 52 million children wasted, uh, one million individuals who lack adequate amounts of food. But on the other hand, there are two billion uh, children over, uh, individuals overweight and obese, uh, amongst which there are 40 mil 41 million children as well. The fact of the matter is that 88% of the countries face a serious burden of either two or three forms of malnutrition. And today, as we kick off this wonderful forum, we have to be reminded on a sobering note, as was also evidenced in the Global Nutrition Report 2017, that the world is off track to meet all the global nutrition targets. We're also looking at a scenario where there are multiple burdens of malnutrition within the same country, within the same community, indeed within the same family. So in my region, it is very common for a woman to walk into, a, into an outpatient's clinic who's anemic and osteoporotic, but at the same time overweight. She's carrying a child who is stunted, and she's accompanied by a husband who has massive central obesity. You see the imprints of non-communicable diseases and poverty on the same families and the same individuals all over the developing countries. To a very large extent, at least to a certain extent, this can be explained on the basis of epigenetic influences. Because malnutrition, intrauterine malnutrition, is a risk factor for obesity and non-communicable diseases in its own right. So if an individual has been malnourished while while in the mother's womb and is subsequently exposed to sedentariness, to a diet that is nutrient poor, that is energy dense, which is high um, in, in sugars and in certain animal proteins and is calorie rich and is highly processed, that individual's risk of obesity and non-communicable diseases rises significantly and science has proved that. And all over the developing countries what we're seeing uh, is individuals in poor communities faced with this environment becoming obese and subsequently developing non-communicable diseases as their countries embrace mo modernization and as they become more economically affluent. As a result, we are seeing a number of different troubling trends. While stunting all over is declining, uh, prevalence of overweight and obesity, especially in children, is rising all over the world. Over the last two decades, we have seen that whereas the consumption of healthy foods has risen modestly, the consumption of unhealthy foods has risen exponentially. Over the last three decades, we have seen prevalence of diabetes doubling. Uh, and because the more individuals are living in urban environments compared to rural settings, the cocktail of malnutrition in urban setting is particularly toxic because of the availability of cheap street foods, which is highly processed in many parts of the world. So it is fair to say that these global shifts to unhealthy diets risk undermining the health gains of the past uh, 50 years. And if there's a red thread in science, it is that things are changing faster than science predicted it should. Already at one degree Celsius warming, just the last five, six months has led to the scientific publication of the following key trend lines and warnings. Number one is, of course, 
the evidence on the 2017 extreme hurricane season in the U.S. with Maria, Irma, and Harvey costing the U.S. economy over 350 billion U.S. dollars in damage. The enormous and very dramatic tipping point of the Great Barrier Reef with 30% of the whole system crossing a tipping point irreversibly lost in an industry that employs 50,000 people compared, by the way, by 10,000 people in the coal industry in Australia that we have the first signs of a slowdown of the Atlantic Meridional Ocean Circulation System, the Gulf Stream that seems to be, for the first time, affected by global warming, regulating the ability to live in the Northern Hemisphere. The signs that biomes like the rainforest cannot cope with more than 25% deforestation before they topple over and irreversibly move towards savanna states, all related to food systems, we are not at this point, but we're approaching it. And then finally, in this part of the world, that the Arctic is melting in an accelerating manner, knowing that this is actually planetary ground zero. Two degrees Celsius warming in the world means five degrees Celsius warming in the Arctic. These are just examples of what's happening at one degree Celsius warming. Now, science has come a long way in providing support to a transformation towards a sustainable, healthy future. The Eat Lancet Commission report that will be released later this year is a very important new step forward. For the first time, we're scientifically quantifying what it means to have universal healthy diets from sustainable food systems. Now, this is one part of this novelty is the conceptual framework. We're taking an Earth system perspective, recognizing we are on the Anthropocene. This is not by choice, it is by necessity. The food system is a big player. We are now recognizing that the whole world needs to transform to sustainable healthy food. So the whole conceptual framework is about what is the sustainability and health dimensions for universal transitions at the planetary scale relevant to the local farmer community business. Defining healthy science-based targets for whole grains, vegetables, fruits, proteins, dairies, added fat, the scientific targets that then can be plugged in to dialogues on defining science-based targets for implementation. On sustainability, the key issues on climate, water, land, biodiversity, nitrogen, phosphorus, the main determinants of the future for humanity on a stable earth system. All of this is advancing in a way that I would argue is going to play an important role in contributing towards this transition because we have a really exciting journey ahead. So in terms of the journey ahead, what is the power and promise of good nutrition? Two million premature deaths can be avoided and up to $200 billion per year in healthcare related costs can be saved through a 50% reduction in global consumption of unhealthy foods and a 100% increase in the consumption of healthy foods. And the Eat Lancet Commission, which is going to put forward its report later this fall, is going to give further granularity to these numbers. In terms of a roadmap for transparency, Forming the global food system, it is essential that governments take ownership, that they are in the driving seats, that they create the right multi-sectoral arrangements that are necessary for an effective response. And this also includes incentives for collaborative division of labor and whole of government performance metrics. It is important for governments and stakeholders to fundamentally rethink and redesign food systems and to focus on the entire food value chain. The public sector must provide the right mix of policy regulations and incentives for the private sector, as well as drive consumer demand for healthy diets. And public-private partnerships are absolutely key to the way forward. The private sector must recognize that it is, a, it is possible to make profits while at the same time be responsible responsive to the health of people, which should also be their responsibility. So just to give you a quick sense of what could be possible through the right uh, public-private synergy, uh, just a quick example of transfats uh, elimination. The World Health Organization has recently put out a call to eliminate transfats uh, from, uh, from food supply. 
In many developed countries, this has already been achieved, but the exposure in the many developing countries is extremely high. For instance, in my country, it is estimated that the energy from trans fats accounts for 6% as opposed to a target, uh, permissible level of 2%. And clearly, the public and private sectors need to work together to forge a way forward. There's evidence that this is entirely possible to eliminate trans fats and save half a million lives annually through appropriate uh, policy action. Sugar is another example where um, and, and, and let's reflect on the United Kingdom's example of setting time-bound, outcome-based targets, uh, which has led the industry to reformulate. Regulation is an important tool um, and a necessary tool for food system transformation. But it is important that developing country governments have the capacity to regulate and that governments provide the right predictability uh, and long-term consistency of policies. I'd also like to mention here that there is a lot of synergy between uh, the food systems transformation agenda and the non-communicable disease prevention and control agenda. Um, just 10, years, 10 days ago, the High Level Commission on Non-Communicable Diseases published its first report uh, urging uh, action immediately uh, it had a number of different recommendations, and many of them are quite relevant to the food system transformation agenda, which we are all here to talk about. We've talked about the responsibility uh, for NCD prevention and control and for food system transformation to be taken at a much higher level than ministries of health, or for heads of government to mandate ministries of health in an appropriate role to be able to convene different actors and to hold them accountable. We've talked about and recommended an, a new independent accountability mechanism so, you can so that we can make headway from the current state of affairs which is centered on self-reporting uh, style of uh, accountability. Uh, we have recommended a fresh approach to engagement with the private sector on the health as the priority principle. Uh, we have clearly emphasized that there's a need to tap into the wealth of expertise uh, in the, of the marketing domain of the private sector. There's a need to tap the expertise of behavioral economists to design public health campaigns for a new era. And that's very relevant for the work that you do. We've called for the creation of a new investors forum so that the health and academic community uh, can speak to the investors um, because we are because they de re read material from a very different source than the ones we think will have impact. We've also called for the creation of uh, an implementers forum which could bring together a wide range of stakeholders. We've reiterated the need for full cost accounting uh, in relation to the total societal burden of non-communicable diseases. And we have explicitly called for the integration of non-communicable diseases into human development uh, and human capital met metrics, which are likely to influence a country's borrowings as early as 2025, which I'm sure you know is extremely important for agenda setting in, uh, in a number of developing countries. So in sum, uh, I, I just want to emphasize two points. I think, first, we have to very squarely recognize that healthy diets are as important as clean water, sanitation, and hygiene. When I went to medical school, our textbooks uh, never talked about healthy diets as a risk factor. We now know that they are the major contributor to burden of disease. And the public health community needs to recognize it very clearly. Secondly, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that the success of the post-2015 development agenda rests on how urgently governments pay attention. Uh, and I just want to quote Gunhild, who said, radically and rapidly, I think these two, uh, and, and then the vice minister who talked about the need for a revolution, I think these are key ingredients of the response that we need. There is a huge demand from countries, as opposed to what we think, for technical guidance, for implementation guidance on the way forward, and it is absolutely imperative for the international community to respond to, that, to those asks and to that challenge more broadly. 
over to you. The uniqueness of it, having this as a platform for science, policy, and business, is having positive domino effects across the world. We are influencing the whole Sustainable Development Goals agenda, recognizing the need for a holistic systems approach for people and planet with food at the center. We're also very significantly influencing the whole starting point with the Atlantic Commission, which is to scientifically quantify universal healthy diets for sustainable food systems. Now we see the development of an Earth Targets platform, which includes communities around the world, from the World Economic Forum to the business sector like WBCSD and the Global Environment Facility, to launch for the first time an Yeet Lancet Commission-inspired Earth Commission, to have an IPCC for the planet, to define scientifically within what boundaries we need to stay to have the chance for prosperity in the future. And that this Earth Commission will provide scientific targets for science-based targets developments across different sectors. This is occurring inspired by the EAT family. So we're seeing a development where the food system is climbing up on the stage. And that we're recognizing that there is a new fundamental pathway to global sustainable development to reach planetary health within planetary boundaries as a prerequisite for social inclusion and prosperity for the future of humanity on Earth. That's right. Thank you for that round of applause, Your Royal, Royal Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attention, and let's get to work now. Yes.